let me call us to order. We're running Ora Brasileira a little bit late, uh, and uh, we are beginning our workshop uh, colloquium on Brazil under Bolsonaro, a topic that I have a feeling already has uh, perspectives from the floor. And you will get a chance from the floor to raise questions and, and uh, enter into a very brief discussion afterwards. Uh, I'm Ken Erickson from Political Science here at the Graduate Center and a, uh, a longtime member of the Bildner group that is sponsoring this. And Mauricio, thank you very much for, for uh, organizing it. Uh, all of you got uh, a program uh, when you came in, so I'm not going to take time uh, to introduce all of our distinguished panelists. Uh, they are distinguished and uh, they're going to give very interesting perspectives. The, the order uh, is uh, going to be a little bit different from the order you see on the screen. I've left their uh, bios up there so you have a little uh, view of that too. And so, to consider yourselves all considered distinguished, that's the extent of my introductions. Bob Kaufman is going to lead off uh, and give uh, a kind of overview, putting Bolsonaro's Brazil in context. So, Bob, you're on. Thanks to the Builder Center for the invitation. we am looking forward to uh, a good conversation. So, um, as we all know, uh, Bolsonaro has established a lot of uh, references to uh, would-be autocrats, aspiring autocrats, and successful autocrats. Uh, he, I think, likes to boast that he's the Trump of the tropics. Uh, but uh, uh, he also seems to me has similarities to other um, even more successful political autocrats, people like uh, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, uh, Recep uh, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, and from a kind of different uh, side of the political spectrum, he was Chavez, people who have already succeeded in bringing down their democracies. Trump, Trump is still perhaps trying, but these people have succeeded. And so one of the, the questions I want to ask uh, today is whether uh, the same thing might happen in Brazil. Um, and my approach to this, as Ken has said, is comparative. Um, uh, I, in fact, draw on a a very rough analytic framework that I developed uh, in a recent article with Steph Haggard, uh, in which we compare uh, democratic backsliding in the United States with uh, the subversion of democracy in Venezuela, Hungary, and Turkey. So that, that is the paper that I'll be talking about, obviously, with reference to uh, Brazil as well. So uh, uh, Venezuela and Turkey and Hungary uh, obviously have de had democratic systems that were more vulnerable uh, than uh, in the United States. Uh, all three had, you know, endemic problems of corruption and efficiency, poor performance, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's not entirely uh, surprising that they reverted to authoritarianism. But uh, that being said, it's also true that each of these countries had reached levels of democratic progress uh, and, and economic development, all three were middle-income countries, uh, that really made a reversion to authoritarianism seem uh, initially quite unlikely. It was something that I think people didn't, uh, uh, didn't expect. And yet in all, all of these cases, in all three, um, uh, despite their many differences, you see elected rulers, freely elected rulers, who, rulers who uh, then proceed to lock themselves into power uh, by chipping away at institutional checks and chipping away at civil liberties and, and electoral rights until um, all that's left really is uh, are, uh, constitutional institutions that are really essentially window dressing for uh, what the reality of authoritarian control. And uh, Brazil, of course, is, I think, uh, comparable to these other middle-income countries, more comparable than in the United States. Uh, uh, it's like the other countries uh, where democracy declined in the sense that it's a middle-income country, uh, and it had appeared, at least until recently, to be making substantial progress 
you know, toward a, uh, a consolidated democracy. I mean, it's been a, depending on how you define a democracy, a democracy for about 30 years. And at least since the mid-1990s, um, it appeared to be headed in a very positive direction. And so uh, I think it's worth asking the question, what went wrong in the three other middle-income countries, and then um, what what similarities and differences are there with Brazil, and can a, a similar process uh, go on under Bolsonaro in Brazil? So I can't go into detail on the three other countries or the United States. I'll come back to the United States in just a little while. But uh, let me sort of sketch out the kind of frame of reference of the, of, of, that we use to analyze backsliding in these other countries. Uh, one factor that was very important in these other countries was uh, a political polarization. And political polarization worked to undermine, in all of these cases, uh, commitments to neutral institutions. Uh, and although the context of division is different, they were very social bases of the division were different in all uh, three countries. That the general point is that where uh, polarization is extreme, uh, people may tend to place a higher priority on winning uh, than they do on support for fair uh, political competition or neutral uh, political institutions. Um, uh, uh, politicians have stronger incentives in polarized contexts to um, exploit the powers of the office, to maximize the powers of their office. And this undermines, as uh, I think Levitsky and uh, Zyblatt have argued, it undermines uh, the kind of normative guide rails, guardrails that um, facilitate moderation and compromise. So uh, we may hear some of this more about Brazil on this score than from the other panelists, but clearly it has different kinds of social cleavages. Um, uh, and uh, I think it's worth noting that Bolsonaro, uh, in spite of the polarization in Brazil, has less personal support than the, the counterparts in, in these other middle income countries. And his, uh, his political base uh, is probably shallower or more shallow than Trump's. Uh, but um, the similarity in, in these other cases is that Bolsonaro built on and stoked um, uh, deep divisions in, in Brazilian society and weakened the political center and uh, widened the distance between the, the extremes. Uh, so that's, at least in a general way, a similarity with these other cases. Now, a second feature of these other middle-income backsliding countries um, and partial feature of the United States as well, uh, was the capture of the legislature. And I think the, um, the distinguishing feature of all three of these cases was that the, the autocratic rulers um, established large legislative majorities, sometimes large super majorities. And this underwrote and legitimated um, uh, the concentration of executive power. The legislature in these cases um, became a kind of a platform uh, through which uh, presidents or prime ministers could politicize other uh, horizontal checks on, on, on political power um, and eventually gain control of the courts and the police and the media and the electoral institutions. So, but it's tended to start with big majorities in the legislature that could um, could um, uh, ratify those kinds of actions. Now, this, it seems to me, is the most important difference between Brazil uh, and these other countries. Uh, uh, I may be, be corrected, by again, by the panelists, but it seems to me that Bolsonaro's coalition in the Congress is much more fragile. Um, it's a heterogeneous coalition. It's patched together uh, on a rather contingent uh, basis, and uh, potentially at least this constitutes a major check uh, on uh, Bolsonaro's ability to attack other, other institutions of accountability. 
the third feature of backsliding in these other cases uh, was the um, incremental dismantling of constitutional institutions and rights. In other words, authoritarianism didn't just get imposed all at once, it was a gradual process. And no single act it taken in isolation could be considered a death blow to democracy. It was sort of hard to tell uh, when uh, democracy uh, ended uh, in those countries. A little bit like um, I've compared it to a frog and you know gradually heating water where the water heats and heats until the frog is dead. And, uh, and uh, that's something about like what happened in these other cases. Now, there are some, uh, I think, again, uh, like polarization, there's some uh, similarities with Brazil in this respect. And it's worth noting that Bolsonaro, as president, has probably more constitutional authority to act unilaterally, uh, even without the assent of the legislature. The Brazilian constitution provides for a very strong president. So uh, even though a, a kind of self-coup, a sudden coup in Brazil is highly unlikely, I think, if, only because the military wouldn't go along, uh, Bolsonaro is in, the, in a good position to deploy the power of the state against uh, political enemies and capture law enforcement and uh, capture a lot of the other attack minorities, uh, attack universities. Uh, and the press, and we're already uh, seeing some of that. So you might be curious uh, to know what we concluded in our comparison uh, between the middle income backsliders of the United States. Um, the short answer is that although um, we don't think a, 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 a reversion to authoritarianism is not impossible, but it's unlikely. And the reason we, uh, one of the reasons at least that we think it's unlikely is that it's a lot harder to alter um, formal constitutional parameters that constrain the, uh, the concentration of power. It would be hard to overturn the two-term limit. It would be hard to overturn the checks of the federal system, the bicameral legislature. There's a whole series of, uh, of uh, constitutional checks that make a full reversion unlikely. Uh, on the other hand, the United States does, you know, if you look at, if you make these comparisons, check a lot of the, the boxes. Um, it's a highly polarized society. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is polarization that will probably persist even after Trump leaves office. Um, his control of the legislature was less complete than in the middle income countries, but um, and certainly less now that the Democrats have taken control of the House. But he's been able to count, Trump has, on the support of the Republicans in the Senate uh, to kind of deflect oversight and to, more important, I think, to reshape the uh, judiciary uh, and, as well as the Justice Department and other institutions. So uh, that's a quite dangerous situation. And then finally, through incremental changes, Trump has uh, again, you know, little by little, the frog in the water, he has taken engaged in behaviors that's normalized uh, actions that we would not have, we would have seen as beyond the pale uh, as little as three years ago. So um, in our article, we concluded that, the, that um, even if the forces that work there ultimately lead to autocracy, in the United States, they are likely to produce a substantial, probably long-term deterioration in the quality of American democracy. And now let me come back briefly to, in conclusion to, to Brazil. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's, not, there's a good reason why uh, Bolsonaro is, uh, likes to call himself the Trump of the tropics. He has many of the same values. He's uh, dismissive of constitutional constraints. He's dismissive of the opposition. Um, he um, uh, feeds on uh, a, a popular antagonism toward uh, uh, minorities. Um, uh, uh, so, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of parallels. Um, again, uh, my sense 
is that the, the lack of um, a, a, a solid legislative majority, uh, coupled with institutional constraints, a bicameral legislature and Brazilian federalism, is going to put pretty strong checks on the ability of Bolsonaro to, um, uh, to become another Orban or another Erdogan. Uh, but I also think it's worth uh, talking about the long term um, that the um, that there's that, that, that like Trump, it seems to me there there's a strong possibility of long term damage uh, to the quality of Brazilian democracy that's not going to um, end uh, even when Bolsonaro himself leaves leaves office. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back here at the Graduate Center. Um, so I'm going to try to, I guess, build a little bit on what Bob's been started out for us in terms of the, you know, from the comparative perspective of how democratic backsliding happens with a little bit more specifics. But really, to get to the conundrum, why? I'm actually a little bit pessimistic in terms of the strategies of populism. I think they're going to, to increase, and they are increasing in the short term, right? Before we get, especially to the municipal elections next year, and then whatever the next cycle for the presidential election is. So basically, nothing's gone to plan since the election of Bolsonaro, right? Uh, so, so Bolsonaro was elected. We were talking about this last November here. Uh, riding this wave of anti-fascismo, so, you know, against everything that was here before, this collapse of that previous system led by the, by the left in Brazil and the rest of Latin America, this big backlash, part of the, part of the thing was, you know, if we, if we break from this, these people who've corrupted the Brazilian state more than anybody else, and this is part of their, uh, part of the language that elected this, this, this group or movement, right? Things will get better, the people will invest again, the economy will, will start growing, and if the economy is growing and we have good people there, then we'll channel this in a way that's productive for Brazilian society. Well, none of that stuff has happened, right? Um, if you follow the, the email that you get from the Brazilian Central Bank, the, it's called the Boletim Focus, and they, they basically measure expectations from the market for economic growth, for inflation, for the exchange rate, and basically, if you get that email, every week you see that the arrows are always red. It always means that things aren't as good as we thought they were going to be. The market is changing their expectations. Um, the economy has barely grown at all. Uh, investment hasn't picked up. Uh, to the extent that there's been a little bit of growth, it's been incredibly concentrated growth. So you have, you know, so if you can trace back to the Fernando Cardoso years in the 90s and the curve of extreme poverty and inequality was always going down, right? So from you know, in the late 90s, Brazil had about 34% of the population in extreme poverty. And that went down to about 28 by the time Lula came to, to power. And by the time, at the best time in the Lula government, that was around 8% in extreme poverty of the population. Um, that's gone back up, right? So the last four years, extreme poverty has increased. Um, maybe around somewhere around 11% of the population, now maybe a little bit larger. Um, to the extent that there's been economic growth, it's been concentrated, so inequality has also been increasing. So you haven't gotten the bang for the buck there in terms of the economic growth or in a growth that's particularly spread. Um, this is bad for public relations, but it's also bad because of legislation that's since been put during the Temer years that really ties together what the federal government can do. There's a hard cap on, on federal spending. The only way that you can increase the amount of money that the government is spending is if the economy grows, and the economy hasn't been growing. Um, so in that sense, you also haven't been able to do much. Uh, I was talking to some of our fellow panelists earlier before the talk, and they'll bring up some of this stuff. It's like, there's very little the federal government can do right now, even if it decides it wants to do something. And because it has such a heterogeneous support coalition to the extent that it has them, it's been hard to decide what they want to spend on, and even if they want to, there's very little that they can accomplish. So, so that hasn't been going too well. As Bob mentioned, one of the things that these, the, these leaders that are trying to push against democratic checks and balances, they're going to go against horizontal institutions that are going to try to keep the executive in check. To a certain extent, in Brazil, they haven't been able to do this with Congress. 
right? Bob already talked about this. Um, even though Bolsonaro had kind of long coattails and he was able to elect, take the PSL from 1% of, the, of Congress to the largest group in, con in Congress, uh, for any one particular party, like 51 deputies, I think, they elected, then there was some moving around. That's not enough to do the job. No president in Brazil has a majority. Right? So they've been having to learn how to do this. And even though they had supposedly a coalition of support, that hasn't translated into being able to push lots of policies. So that system of checks and balances, they haven't really been able to, to attack. So what have they been able to do? And we talked about this in November, and some people were really upset here that we didn't sound more alarmed. Uh, and, but at the time, I said, well, we have to use the tools of comparative politics. And they haven't really attacked any of the formal constraints of democracy yet. But they have attacked many norms, right? So not only norms of political competition, of respect for the opposition, but recently there's been a bunch of meddling by the executive into the second and third tiers of the bureaucracy. Um, and that's one of the things that Bolsonaro, by being kind of a centralized you know, politician, the president, you know, a couple weeks ago he said, you know, I'm not the president of a banana republic. Like, the president has to have certain powers. And if I decide I wanted to change this guy from the treasury over there, you know, my people need to make it happen. Now, should the president of Brazil really be concerned about some guy running the alfandega or the customs in one port? Like, probably not. But to the extent that he is, he's been very forceful about, you know, if you don't follow the line, then we should fire you. And this has been used a lot in a witch hunt for people that are supposed communists. Right? I never thought I was going to be having this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, communists all through the, uh, yeah. Um, you know, if you're not one of my friends, you're one of the communists, you're not even a center left or any of that stuff. So there has been an attack in terms of not respecting certain norms. So for example, a large portion of the Brazilian state is highly corporatist, as is, as are other states in Latin America. But so for example, the Procuradoria, which is the public prosecutor, just recently, they, they're used to giving a list with three people that then the president is supposed to pick from one of those. That's a way that you have a certain degree of bureaucratic independence, and then the president picks from that list. They didn't respect that norm. Um, appointing other people to other parts of the bureaucracies that used to be called pockets of efficiency. Peter Evans is back there, so um, it's cool to be able to talk about that with him here. Um, these pockets of efficiency in the planning ministries, in the Banco Central, and you know, in all, in all the, the where they're used to be able to run the show in their way. There's a little bit of poking in there, directly by the president, right? And changing their minds and, and a bunch of all that stuff. Why are they doing that? Because they don't have a lot more to show. Um, differently from Trump, where the, the, the favorability ratings have stayed fairly common, or fairly stable, um, Bolsonaro has a lot, a lot of public support. So his positive rating has gone down by 20%. His negative, so in Brazil they, they lump the bad and horrible, puni um, That right now is 39%, the last poll that came out. Right, so you're starting to become a minority president, um, which is you know complicated. Um, okay, so what do you do when things aren't going well? You've promised a bunch of stuff. You can't really do any of that stuff because you can't force Congress. You're going to play to the crowd. Because the one thing that you still, people still dislike more than you is that sentiment of the antipetismo, right? This, you know, we hate these guys who did all these horrible things. And you can ride, you can unite a lot of people with that conversation, right? And, you know, the same poll that I was looking at, um, the antipetismo people are still about at 36, 38 percent of the population. Nobody believes that the PT is, is, is going to be a major player right this second. But there's still a bunch of people that will refuse to vote for the PT. Right around the same amount of people who would refuse to vote for Bolsonaro right now. So what do you need? You need to do what you did successfully at the last election, which is to completely crater the center. You need to force this polarization. How are you doing that? You play to the peanut crowd, right? You, you need to engage with the more extreme portions of the factions on Twitter. Um, the other day, on uh, 7th of September, Brazilian Independence Day, um, Bolsonaro's there at the big thing, and who does he have on both of his sides? He has the head of the second and third largest channels in Brazil. So this idea that you need to reach the population through media, so ECO and SPT, um, not global. 
Um, so this kind of fighting this battle against the media, against uh, journalists on, in general, trying to stir nationalism by calling the French colonialists over the Amazon thing. At the same time, you're blaming NGOs, you're blaming, blaming the crowd on the left, you're blaming the center. To the extent that the center has also started detaching from him, he started attacking the Doria from the PSDB in Sao Paulo. Right? Uh, who, who are the people from the center in Brazil right now? They kind of are a little bit on the down and out, but to the extent that they've started showing up, Bolsonaro has been hitting them or has had his kids beat them on Twitter, right? It's the younger son that does most of the tweeting. <laughs> uh, attacking the Northeastern governors. If you've heard me here in the Bildner Center before, you know I study subnational politics, and I study especially regionally poli regional politics in Brazil. And he's been caught on, on camera calling you know, Northeastern governors a bunch of names and saying, you know, all these backward people with no education, and what we gotta do is we gotta treat them hard. Nothing for them. Um, it's a self-defeating strategy. Right, in the long term, and it's bad for Brazilian democracy, it's bad for the economy, but it is potentially an, a winning electoral strategy. So if things get bad, you stir up the, you know, 30%, somewhere between 30 and 40% of the Brazilian population. If they're forced to go to a second round like they did last time, and they go against the PT, that's enough to win. You can scare a bunch of centrist people into voting against them. So, I don't know how much sense I can make out of, of everything that's going on right now, but I do think that all of these, this menu of strategies that populists use that lead to democratic backsliding, my fear is that we're going to, need to see an increase in these in the short term, especially if the specter of the PT stays around, right? We were chatting about before, the, the best thing that could ever happen to Bolsonaro is somebody lets Lula out of jail. They say they don't want it, but they really could benefit from it um, because it's, it's easy to point away from what's not happening into this supposed polarization. Um, I think we'll learn a lot from next year's municipal elections to see if the Bolsonaro wave or has peaked or not. It'll reveal a lot if they've been able to capitalize into the local level. Um, they don't have a lot of party organization. So I think that'll reveal the kind of politics that, 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 that we'll see in the next couple of years. But I, I think this playing to the crowd, nationalism, fighting purported enemies, domestically and externally, I think, I think we're going to see more of that. And then, you know, are you going to see enough of that that then Brazilian democracy will be broken in a way that it will take a long time to rebuild from? Like, I, I don't know. But right now, pessimism seems to be more, of a, more likely than, than not. It's always so depressing, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, but that's where we are. Thank I like to think that I stuck to the time too, right? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here among such a distinguished uh, group of speakers. Uh, I'm actually going to be fairly short, and uh, my plan here is to add a, an element to the discussion, which is the fight against corruption in Brazil and the, the weaponization of the fight against corruption for electoral slash political gain in Brazil. And I think it's very hard to talk about uh, demo democratic backsliding without looking at the rule of law in Brazil. And quite a, a paradox that it's taking shape uh, only after, what, seven, eight months, now nine months of, Bolsonaro, of the Bolsonaro administration, which is namely that the Lava Jato candidate is actively pushing back against law enforcement agencies in Brazil in ways that we haven't seen, I would say, ever since the return of democracy in the country, right? Um, and I'm referring specifically at, at um, his decision to appoint an attorney general, a, a chief general prosecutor, the person he chose, um, and he explicitly said that he was choosing Mr. Aras because Mr. Aras aligned with him. This was the word that he, he used um, on several occasions. Uh, also, his active, uh, active involvement in micromanagement and leadership changes to the federal police and to the Brazil's uh, federal customs agency. Uh, also, overruling his, his uh, Minister of Justice, Sergio Moro, in several occasions. Uh, and in the middle of all this, his, uh, or the government's decision 
to overhaul uh, Brazil's main anti-money laundering agency, uh, which was a really respected agency in, uh, named COAF. Uh, it's Brazil's uh, in, uh, financial intelligence unit. Uh, this is all happening at the same time. While there are other um, signs, uh, say outside the, the Planalto Presidential Palace, in the Supreme Court, in Congress, um, uh, very alarming signs. Also, the, the Vaza Jato scandal that exposed uh, clear cases of uh, prosecutorial and judicial overreach uh, in the context of Lava Jato. Uh, so, you know, why? I think it's worth asking the question, right? Uh, why is Bolsonaro doing this at this point? Uh, and I, I would go back to some of the things that were uh, mentioned here uh, by Professor Kaufman. Uh, regarding kind of the populist instinct of Bolsonaro, populist slash nationalist, um, the, the fact that he, he always, uh, from the beginning, was pushing for a, a, an AG who's aligned with him. Uh, clearly, you know, it's impossible to miss the, the, the parallels with, with uh, President Trump here in the United States in the sense that, you know, you can't accept someone leading a government agency, a, a law enforcement agency, that it's not aligned with you, that it does not have personal loyalty to the president. Uh, this was the case with, with DOJ, with FBI. Uh, but also there are more, I would say, mundane reasons for, for Bolsonaro's attack on, on uh, law enforcement agencies, which is namely his son, um, Flavio Bolsonaro. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Flavio Bolsonaro has been the target of a, an anti-money laundering investigation in Rio de Janeiro when he was uh, a state legislator. Um, basically, the accusation is that um, members of his staff was, were paying back uh, part of their salaries to Flavio Bolsonaro himself. There was a payment to the first lady, so, so pretty close to the president. And also, there are really, you know, uh, some robust accusations that some of these people who were uh, serving in his cabinet were directly involved with the so-called militias in Rio de Janeiro. So. Uh, really, really compromising, uh, or I would say it hasn't been uh, uh, convicted or anything, obviously, uh, but some uh, uh, potentially compromising evidence there. And when you look back at the decisions taking against uh, law enforcement agencies, so one of them, the, the, the decision to dismantle COAF and to change it, to submit it to, to the central bank, to sack the director, Coafi was the first, uh, the first institution to flag the financial transactions involving Bolsonaro's son. Uh, Bolsonaro was also actively involved and overruled Moro uh, in the decision to appoint the, the head of the federal police unit in Rio, who's conducting the investigation of his son, or should be conducting the investigation of his son. The next attorney general will be the attorney general who will decide whether or not to prosecute his son in case uh, robust evidence emerges there. Uh, his son is now a senator, of course, uh, and a, a key articulator for, for the government in Congress. Um, so, and at the same time, it, it is interesting to see how things evolve just now. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Olavo de Carvalho. Olavo de Carvalho is kind of a guru for the Bolsonarista camp. Um, and just, I think it was yesterday, he was tweeting that Actually, this is not about the fight against corruption. The fight against corruption is a means to overthrow communism and socialism in Brazil. This was not about Lava Jato at the end. Uh, and you know, how, how can we make sense of all this, right? Uh, and you know, going back to the election, even before the election of Bolsonaro, uh, I think there's a, a structural tension right now uh, in Brazil that explains a lot of the political volatility that we have seen at least since 2016 with the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, uh, all the turbulence during the Temer years, which is, on one hand, Brazil, after 30 years or so of democracy, has developed really robust uh, and powerful tools to crack down on corruption, right? And, and uh, technically, Brazil has developed one of the most sophisticated anti-money laundering uh, uh, systems, uh, Brazil passed now new rules on the bargaining agreements uh, that are being kind of experimented uh, since 2000. It was it passed in, in 2013. Um, 
Brazil has developed strong ties with international authorities here in the United States, DOJ, uh, SEC, but also Swiss authorities to track uh, uh, international flows of, of money, asset seizure, etc. Uh, but at the same time that you have developed these very powerful uh, tools and a very active um, federal prosecutorial body and a poli federal police, one might argue too active, uh, actually, uh, you also have a political system uh, where kind of bribes and corruption are still a, co uh, a common currency. I would say that Brazil has uh, one of the worst uh, or has really, really problematic uh, relations between money and politics. If you look at how politics is financed in Brazil, the lack of any legislation on lobbying, Brazil has just a terrible party system, uh, ultra-fragmented Congress, um, and so on and so forth. So Brazil was living under this structural tension, has been living for, under this structural tension for quite some time. And I personally believe that there are two ways of solving this problem, right? One, and the good way would be to reform the political system, to ease the tension, uh, to have more tr party transparency, better rules to finance campaigns, better uh, controls over lobbying, and so on and so forth. And we would have the, the kind of the bad solution, which is overturning uh, some, if not most, of the gains uh, when it comes to fighting corruption. Um, and the question that I would leave here is whether we're seeing the second alternative under the Lava Jato candidate, um, Jair Bolsonaro. I'll, I'll stop here with this uh, provocation. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mauricio, for the invitation. Um, I'm uh, here just to make some comments on uh, uh, not, not my previous speakers, uh, uh, but I was asked to speak a little bit about um, the economy, and particularly the macroeconomy. Uh, before I do so, I mean, uh, it struck me as I was uh, listening to Professor Kaufman, um, you know, what do Turkey, Venezuela, Brazil, and Hungary have in common? in terms of the economy, and that is that uh, in one way or another, through different channels, they all, they were all beneficiaries of, of that particular cycle of growth uh, that came from the early 2000s, uh, and in the Brazilian case, uh, extended until 2011, and that is the incorporation of China, uh, the massive incorporation of China into the global trading system and the resulting commodity boom, uh, and in particular, both in the case of, uh, of all these countries, they were and, and Hungary. It has been an interesting study on this indirectly. Um, they were particularly beneficiaries of the enormous uh, two percent of global GDP equivalent fiscal stimulus that China did um, in 2009, and that arguably much more than any other policy in the world is what kept uh, some hope alive uh, at the deep of the last recession. And, and Brazil's ties to, to this particular cycle is, 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 is extraordinarily close. I mean, um, you know, the commodity boom of, of 2010, 2011 made Brazil growth uh, in 2011 at its highest rate ever recorded uh, uh, in, in, since uh, the 70s, which was uh, at 8% growth. So um, uh, a lot of what happened uh, politically in Brazil uh, in these years, um, and particularly during the rule administration, has much to do uh, with the economic cycle and the ability um, uh, to, uh, to both uh, um, spend a lot fiscally and at the same time uh, appear to be a very prudent fiscal management uh, with very low rates of growth of the domestic public debt. Um, and of course all of this was uh, dismantled uh, very rapidly during the Dilma administration um, uh, which, in addition to growth mismanagement, and I think there is a consensus uh, from her adversaries and from her supporters alike, that her administration was a disaster in terms of economic policy. Um, uh, but a lot of it was because she was having to deal 
was the abrupt end of, a, of, of an incredibly prosperous cycle. Uh, and that made things uh, very uh, uh, considerably easier, uh, particularly in the first uh, rule administration, uh, where many things were possible. So that's, that's the background. Another quick observation is partly as a result of that, partly it's an interesting thing I, I, for political scientists to, to look at. Economists have long made this claim, um, but the, the fact is that what most Brazilian economists think was the, the, the glue that kept politics in Brazil together uh, during the Cardoso administration, certainly the second Cardoso administrations, and during the Lula administrations, was the capacity uh, not only to uh, do an incredible increase in taxation, which is unprecedented in non-war periods. I mean, the only, in historically, the only period where, where you had in about 20 years, a 10 percentage points of GDP increase in taxation was during the, 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 the French Revolution. So uh, this was an incredible uh, achievement to go from a, a rate of 20 percent of GDP taxation to 30 percent of GDP taxation in 10 years. Um, but in addition to that, the continued growth of, of public expenditure and, and uh, Ministers of Finance from Palocci to Montega to, uh, to Meirelles, they always would start their conversations showing a graph that showed that how public expenditures in Brazil were growing at 6% in real terms uh, since uh, in the year 2000, 2001, when the crisis finished. And, and that's also an extraordinary achievement. I mean, you know, Australia has been able to do that but that's almost uh, unique uh, that anybody can, can do that for such a long period of time uh, to grow public expenditures at 6% uninterruptedly uh, every year in real terms. And so, of course, this came to an end. And um, that was the misery of the Dilma administration um, and, um, and, and, and what has been put in place uh, subsequently is something to, to try to deal with this. But one thing that I think all discussions have to keep in mind when you're talking about Brazil today is that there is a fiscal crisis. Uh, this fiscal crisis is, is, is unavoidable and it's very hard to deal with. Uh, it's not as, there is no fiscal space. So you, you know, I mean, if you can try to increase taxation, but Brazil has taxes already that are higher than the average of the OECD countries. So, you know, it's bordering on 40% of GDP, depending on how you calculate, so it's higher than the US, the level of taxation in Brazil. It's also extraordinarily inefficient because basically rich people in Brazil don't pay tax. There is no significant income tax, so everything is taxed uh, through consumption. And it's not a well designed, value added uh, tax, it's basically a, a tax on, 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 on gross turnover. So, it's, 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 a, it's about the most effective tax system you can have, uh, but it's punishing, right? Because if you open a business, for example, you're taxed the first months because you just sold something, even if you had absolutely no gain whatsoever or anything like that. So anyway, there, there, there are many tales of woes, uh, but the fact is that you know, it, it's very hard to tax uh, in Brazil anymore. Uh, very difficult to change this tax system, and obviously you have to contain expenditures. And, and as was mentioned here, um, in the 88 Constitution, in the post uh, the democratic thing, the, because of mistrust of a number of issues and because of political deals, most taxes in Brazil are not real taxes, they are contributions and they are tied to specific forms of spending. Um, and you require constitutional changes to alter any detail of that spending. So it's not only that it goes to education, it's that it goes so much and so much goes to such a program under the Ministry of Education. And that is in the Constitution. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a major problem and it's the, it's the political problem of the moment because you know, the, the government can't put together the budget for 2020 uh, it will ask for an exception, as I think uh, was the case in 2019, where the Congress finally approved, the uh, first time in the history of the Brazilian modern Congress, 
an exception that granted the government uh, extraordinary power to issue more debt. Uh, and, and the issue wasn't that it was more debt than the government was originally planned to issue. It was that that debt could be issued to be used for purposes that normal debt couldn't be used for. So the, the, it, it gets extraordinarily complicated. And, and that's the situation that the, 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 the country is in. I think Bolsonaro has been lucky in the fact that um, he inherited a situation that from the macro perspective of the terms of fiscal policy uh, was very well advanced. Of course, Timmer was the most stupid guy that you can think of to be caught in the middle of that corruption scandal when, when he was ready to approve an important reform. Uh, that reform is now approved. Um, it helps, but it helps over a decade. Many other things have to be done. Uh, so far, there's been really no rupture in the uh, economic policy. In fact, that began uh, in the last year of the Dilma's administration. So, you know, you had this policy going through. Um, and, and it is a policy that's focused on keeping the, the, the Brazilian fiscal system afloat. Uh, that's the only objective of macro policy. There's no other objective. Um, and uh, as a result of that, or perhaps independently of that, growth uh, has never recovered. So the uh, Brazilian uh, economy suffered a 25% uh, decrease in per capita income in, in the three years of the last recession. Uh, it has, per capita income has not grown since. So maybe 1%, depending on how you calculate. So it's, it's a, a real impoverishment of the, of the population. But the worst part of this, if you look forward, is that there was a 35% drop in investment. So uh, at certain points in Brazil in 2017, and, and the first two quarters of 2018, there was act, actually capital destruction in Brazil. There wasn't enough capital formation to cover the rate of depreciation. So the economy, in effect, was diminishing in its uh, capacity to produce. And, and that's, that's a real tough, tough question right now. It's, it's a big puzzle, because why isn't investment growing? And we were just discussing this, and it's, it's yeah, maybe people say it's all the uncertainty, of course. There's tremendous political uncertainty. But if you think in terms of economic policy, as I said, economic policy, I mean, there was much more uncertainty during the Temer administration than there is today. Um, and yet, you know, and a lot of the people that were asked when, when they would return to investment, they said, oh, well, you know, when the politics gets a bit easier, you know, we'll return to it. And it never returned. Um, and and that's, that's a, a tremendous constraint. Brazil's potential GDP growth as we speak is below 1%. Uh, Brazil is a sclerotic economy. It's, it's a prematurely mature uh, middle-income economy, but it, 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 it behaves in many ways as the more advanced, uh, older economies. There is a demographic transition that's very negative, that's going in place. Productivity growth has been negligent, um, below 1% for the last decade or so. Um, and, and it's not clear that despite the fact that investment dropped 35%, capacity utilization is strained. So it's not, you know, maybe, maybe the, the, the point is that there is really no, no real outlook there uh, for investors to, to jump at it. You know, uh, the hope uh, that this administration has, and I don't think is a bad bet, uh, is that by accelerating the concessions program, primarily because privatization is going to take a long time, uh, they can mobilize some amount of capital uh, uh, that will kind of spurt this growth. It's true that uh, the corruption and so on and so forth, the destruction of the BNDS, uh, which I personally don't think was a bad destruction, but that clearly disrupted the investment program. Uh, the problem with BNDS is not so much that it lent, uh, you know, more than the World Bank every year into Brazil, uh, you know, something like 20, 25 billion dollars a year of lending, but it lent it so badly, right? So most of the stuff went nowhere. But nevertheless, the, the, the failure of the BNDS uh, it affected investment. It, you know, it is 
one of the reasons investment is so much lower. But, but you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe this something can be done that will, in a sort of a Hirschman-like sense, try to coalesce a, a, a you know an overlapping of interests uh, and create uh, new investment. I think that's uh, what we are waiting for. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, all of the all of you. I was sort of looking for a straw to grasp, a straw of optimism to grasp. And finally, Paulo gave it to me when he mentioned uh, Albert Hirschman. So <laughs> we might think about it or, or keep our fingers crossed that something we don't see coming might improve things. This has been a remarkable, distressing set of comments. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm now, uh, the floor is open for your observations. I recognize a number of you out there. We're going to use the Bildner Center uh, style of question and answer. That is, I will take three questions from you. Our panelists will jot them down so that you will answer sets in sets of three uh, as we go ahead. And as I recognize you, even if I know who you are, I would like you to introduce yourself so everybody else will. So, ready for observations. Yes, please. Identify yourself. Stand up so everybody can hear you, please. Hi, my name is Lucas. I, uh, I'm a research intern here at the Graduate Center. Uh, my question is about political polarization in Brazil. It's become commonplace to criticize polarization as a threat to democracy in Brazil. But for me, it seems that polarization has always been a feature in political, the political life of Brazil, at least since the 1940s, with Vargas and opposition then the military dictatorship, uh, then in the 90s and the early 2000s between the PT and PSDB. So polarization is not new to Brazil, nor is unique to Brazil. The US is polarization, Argentina, Chile, Portugal, um, Spain, they all are, have polarized politics. So my question is, is it polarization really, which is the threat to democracy, or the fact that one of the poles, the one that is f uh, far to the right, has, been, has gone further to the right, and now it's more extreme. And the one that's on the left, is because it's on the same spot, it's always been. The PT didn't change much on its discourse or its practice. It's pretty much the same since the Lula years. So the fact is, the fact is which one is the bigger, the bigger threat to, to democracy? Is it the fact that the right pole is going further to the right, or is it the polarization itself? Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. And let me ask you all to keep your questions brief as you go. Next question. Peter Evans, introduce yourself as Peter Evans. <laughs> I'm Peter Evans. I'm a emeritus professor of sociology from Berkeley and currently on a at Brown. And I'm curious what the panelists think is the current attitude of big capital in Brazil toward the Bolsonaro regime and its future. Obviously, big capital uh, was happy to get rid of the Pepe. It sat on the sidelines, the parties with which it was affiliated, uh, the Pepe, the Pepe, the Pepe, sat on the sidelines, uh, and the cultural wing of big capital, let's say, Hugo, uh, was clearly uh, promoting Bolsonaro at the end. So big capital what came into this pro-Bolsonaro in a quiet way. The question is, now that we've got the uh, poor economic results, is big capital going to desert Bolsonaro, or will they just continue to sit on the sidelines? Thank you, Peter. A third question. Yes, please. Introduce yourself. Uh, Ricardo Tavares from TechPod as a consulting company. Um, the, the defeat of Macri in the primaries in Argentina, uh, losing against the, the Peronist uh, ticket, sent an alarm into the Bolsonaro administration. And, um, and I think the reading that is being made is that Macri failed because uh, reforms were very slow. And that, in this context, there was a Twitter from one of the sons, 010203, 
I think mm -hmm. zero two, um, saying that um, uh, it's very hard to reform Brazil under democracy. But ironically, last week, a very difficult bill that was five years in Congress, the reform of the, uh, kind of a mini reform of telecommunications, right. passed it in Congress. So my question is actually about executive legislative relations. So aren't we seeing a positive side, uh, taking our request for positive things, <laughs> in a new dynamic of executive um, uh, legislature relations in Brazil, in which the legislature is under pressure to deliver on its own, and it's really sensitive to the economic reform agenda as well? Thank you. Okay, now you have three questions. Uh, Georgi, uh, actually, Roberto, Bob, I'm going to the first one. Since you were first to present, Bob, how would you like to begin the responses? And you can address, each of you can address all three as you see. No, I can't, I can't address it. You will have to leave your observation to the other panelists because I don't have the, uh, enough of the kind of fine grain of knowledge to, to respond to that. Um, oh, sorry. There may be a switch on somewhere. You might have somewhere. to switch it, yeah. You see yeah. this one? Yeah. 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 This one. Yeah. 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 We got it. Good. So, um, actually, let me first say just a quick comment about your point about growth. Um, uh, uh, one thing I didn't say, and I, I, but I'm very much aware of it, is the fact that um, the autocrats that I talked about got a huge boat boost. From, um, from growth in their society. And Trump, uh, even though he is claiming more credit than he deserves for growth, has also, I think, uh, gotten a lot of political capital uh, from that. And, and so uh, that, I think, was an advantage that, as you implied, at least Bolsonaro uh, does not have. Uh, let me. Uh, let me address the question of polarization. I mean, it's an important question, and I'll stay just with that. Um, so uh, stable democracy requires some propensity to compromise, and at least in my judgment. You, know, you can't have two warring camps and uh, have, a, have a stable democracy. So, and, and regardless of where the source comes from, whether it's from the right or from the left, uh, that, I think, poses serious problems uh, for a democracy for the reasons I've already suggested, because people in that situation think that winning is more important than, than anything else, including uh, neutral institutions or fair electoral competition. In the United States, um, the, like what you're saying in Brazil, the, the principal movement has been on the right, that the Republicans have moved farther to the right, and, whereas, uh, and there's some movement to the left uh, among the Democrats, but the Democrats have stayed closer to the center. In a certain sense, you know, with due respect, I think that's irrelevant, uh, because, again, it doesn't matter which side is moving uh, farther away from the center. The fact is that if you've got, uh, if you've got a large distance between the main competing polls, uh, that uh, uh, makes um, uh, norms of democratic compromise very difficult to maintain. Uh, so, um, and by the way, you can also see cases where it's the left, two other points, you can also see cases where the left has moved, or, you know, the populist left in, uh, in Latin America, I think, moved quite considerably farther to the left over time, including Chavez. Um, and uh, secondly, the cases that you mentioned, uh, Spain, Chile, and the United States, of uh, countries with polarization, uh, are all not accidentally cases where democracy has been under significant, um, significant strain. Georgie? I'm just going to uh, just piggyback on what uh, Bob just said about the polarization thing. Um, I'm going to leave the question on, on international capital. 
over to my friend over there. Um, but in terms of polarization, um, I agree with Bob that it doesn't necessarily matter if it's the right or the left that's pushing to the pushing further away from the center. It's what you get that there's no overlap in the middle where people can compromise, right? And I think what you said is right that polarization is not necessarily new, but it's also not stable. I think what you're describing is this kind of cyclical nature of that Latin American politics has had periods of very high polarization. And no surprise there, that's when democracy breaks down, historically. right? That's when you had those periods of, you know, you had the Estado Novo, you had the, the military coup in, 60, in the 60s, and you had other periods of a lot of trauma. And when you had other periods where, where polarization decreased significantly. And that's where it's much easier to build a coalition. Now, OK, you can call the PES the Bay-led government to the right of center. You can call the PT a coalition a little bit to the left of center. Um, but that's when there's a lot of overlap. So I don't think, I think polarization is one of those variables that we can measure. And it goes up and it goes down. And I think now, not just in Brazil, but in the rest of the world, there's a lot of rising polarization, including here in the United States. But I think I share Bob's concern that the, the danger for democracy is that that overlap where you can build a coalition is smaller. Um, so yeah, of course, the right is pushing further to the right, further than before. Certain people on the left has also, have also pushed further uh, during the pink tide. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the danger. The danger is that people are willing to jump from the center because they're scared of the other side. Right? All the people who voted for Bolsonaro because he's the anti pt There's plenty of people. Don't kid yourself. There's many people who don't love Bolsonaro. But they're such anti petistas that they're willing to overlook the other stuff. That's the danger of polarization, because you get scared. And that's how you end up with Alckmin with the worst showing for the past debate in a generation. Marina Silva's vote totals cratering. The MDB disappearing. It's, that's the scary part, I think, that there's no viable center. Um, and that, and then the other thing that I'll kind of throw my bit in real quick about the which alarm came from the Macri thing. I'm not sure that they that that's the message um, that they took. I think they absolutely took the message like, hey, the left is still alive, right? If the Peronists can do it, then maybe the PT can do it too. But I'm not so quite so sure that their concern is we need to reform faster. And I think that's the point that I was trying to make with my talk. I think it's, if we're not getting the other things, including the young son, who's the one who tweets constantly, right, which is the, the, the vereador from Rio. And he says, you know, maybe through democracy we can't do this thing. And many people got scared because then it's like, ooh, that's the first sign where they've kind of dipped into the language that, of not respecting democratic norms. I think that's why we're seeing a hyping of the use of Twitter and the use of language and the picking enemies outside inside. Um, my concern is more for that there, there, there's an incentive to double down more. Um, I don't necessarily think that the, and, and I think reasonable minds can disagree about this. I don't know if the message was we need to reform the economy faster. Uh, because Macri tried, okay, he also tried and he went through the process and it was very slow and then the economy in Argentina didn't rebound. Um, yeah, but I'm not so sure, quite so sure that that's my reading of, of what happened in Argentina. Roberto. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just on the issue of polarization, I think you know political analysts in Brazil are you know debating a lot why Bolsonaro is becoming so unpopular so fast, right? If you compare where other presidents were after seven eight months in government, uh, you know Sarney. Collor, uh, Itamar, uh, FHC, Lula, Dilma. Um, there is an exception, probably, but you know, no one had this uh, this low level of approval rating. And my explanation is that it's trending down so fast because the economy, as Paulo brilliantly explained, is still in shambles with 13 uh, million unemployed uh, and so on and so forth. But also because a lot of the support for Bolsonaro was driven by the anti-PT sentiment, right? People who chose to, who were saying never PT in the runoff, and then they elected Bolsonaro, but now that he's president, all of a sudden PT is not that relevant anymore, uh, at least not until we have uh, a new round of elections, uh, maybe local elections next year, or uh, presidential elections in, in uh, almost three years from now. Um, so now we're seeing that 
Bolsonaro's approval ratings are not only went down substantially, uh, but they are still trending down, right? The number of people who supported Bolsonaro say that bo the, the government was good or excellent has de decreased substantially. The neutral, well, Brazil, we have this uh, strange, strange way of measuring uh, the approval of governments has increased, the, so the, the new people who feel ambiguous about the government, and the rejection has also increased substantially. Um, so just on, on, on one point, when you look at you know, polarization in Congress, how it translates to the number of, of uh, political parties or their strength in Congress, you see that after the 2018 elections, the number of seats that the left had remain unchanged, right? Something like 140 in the lower house. Uh, but at the same time, the center collapsed. PSDB, PMDB, the, the so-called Centrão, really reduced in size, and you had the emergence of an extreme right uh, force that never existed before, at least not in this way, which is now the second largest party uh, in Brazil, PSL. So, I mean, visually, you can see kind of the polarization, and I would argue that um, the left, if you compare where the PT is right now to where the PT was in the 2000s when Lula was in power, I mean, PT has also shifted to the left, it's very engaged in the free Lula campaign, etc. Uh, maybe not to the extent that, of course, um, the, the right has radicalized itself, but I, th I think there is a, 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 a kind of a pressure to the polls there. Um, the comment on, on the big capital and, and uh, the passing of the big reforms, etc., Bolsonaro came to power with, with the promise of changing how politics is done in Brazil, ending the so-called coalition presidentialism, right? He, he's, he was saying that he was not negotiate ministers for support, ministries for support, I'm sorry, for support, etc. Uh, and it failed. Uh, it failed miserably. Uh, the government doesn't have a base in, in Congress right now, but something else happened at the same time, which is a prime minister emerged called Rodrigo Maia, uh, a, a person who, who is the leader of the so-called Centrão in Congress, really a politically savvy, uh, and also at the same time the new speaker of the, the Senate, uh, Alcolumbre, has also been working closely with him. Uh, and if you look at what happened with the pension reform debate, basically they were able to kind of whip the votes and have this really impressive vote to, for a constitutional amendment. We'll see the vote now in, in the Senate. Probably Brazil will pass uh, the reforms. Uh, so I think for the answer for the big capital, you're right. They were betting. You know, I, I used to joke that Wall Street was betting on Alckmin, Faria Lima was betting on Bolsonaro. They, you know, they were like the real Bolsonaristas, but now they became uh, Rodrigo Maistas, I think. Uh, in the sense that they think that the, the real driver of reforms is the, the is Brazil's prime minister. Thank you. Paulo. Uh, yes, first of all, I'm mean, really glad that uh, Professor Peter Evans is here. I mean, great admirer of all the work you've done. But let me, let me say that uh, I believe you misread the so-called big capital uh, alliances in Brazil. Um, it, the PT and Big Capital, uh, after a difficult start, did very well together. And, and in fact, it, it, it was a very, very powerful alliance. And um, it's very difficult to know what Big Capital in Brazil really works on, except that you, you know that the families are all together and they control incredible the, the degree of concentration is, is extraordinary, but they, they spread themselves quite wide. Uh, but obviously one of the big ones uh, was the construction industry and, and the ability uh, of uh, both the government and through the BNDS uh, and uh, Minha Casa Minha Vida and so on and so forth, Caixa Econômica, that was really a boom. For, uh, for the uh, large capital in Brazil. And, and, uh, and the last hurrah was really this very misguided attempt to create Brazilian multinationals and Brazilian champions. And as I said, I mean, the, it's, it's not so much an ideological debate. I've always admired a lot of Alice Amson's analysis and your analysis um, on, on, on the ability of states to put together effective uh, industrialization strategies. But somehow in Brazil, uh, uh, 
it, it's just poor decision making. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, how many mistakes uh, the technocrats and others, and I used to be one of them at, at, at the NDS we, we have made. I mean, and the last bet was just disastrous. If you think of the Shis company, what was his name? Uh, Aki Bachista. Aki Bachista. And, and then all of these other ones. I mean, and these were billions and billions of dollars every time more and more money. So I don't know what it is, but that was a true wasteful uh, waste of capital. <laughs> Um, and, and, and it was very closely politically aligned. I, again, I second what uh, Roberto said about Bolsonaro. I mean, I, financial interests were with Bolsonaro. I think the real side of the economy never supported Bolsonaro and still doesn't. Uh, the strong, what we call the big capital in Brazil, are, are definitely anti bolsonaristas and particularly Rage Global. I mean, you couldn't get a more anti Bolsonarista group than Rage Global. And they are suffering for it. Uh, and, and Bolsonaro is making it very clear. Like, for example, he took away the, the, the decision that you had to publish your financial results in a newspaper. You can now do it online. And that's, uh, that's going to take a lot of advertising out of the newspapers. So, uh, so, so that, that uh, I just wanted to clarify that. The other point that I leave as, as a question for the panel more, and then it goes in the direction that I think we've been discussing, it's, it's, it, it struck me that the most important political figure in Brazil in the last few years was Roberto Cunha. Was Roberto his first love? Eduardo. Eduardo, Eduardo. Eduardo Cunha. And, and Eduardo Cunha really uh, created an enormous amount of power in, in the lower house and made the, the president of the lower house the second most important political figure in Brazil. He clearly was the person that was a, able to impeach Dilma. Um, he suffered for it, but, um, uh, but the, the, this idea of the extraordinarily active role of, of the president of the lower house has to me, been the most marking political side of Brazil in the last few years. And I, I wonder what implications that will have in, in the near future. Thank you. Now, for a second round, I wanted to, to put in a, a request for a little elaboration on the blaming of communists, that is, if we're talking about polarization here. Uh, and not even Trump is talking about communists. Yeah, yeah, they're talking about socialists here. But uh, it, it seems like we're in another era. Uh, and, and yet, it, the way you have presented, because I haven't seen those, the, the, the blaming of communists when they're rooting people out of, uh, of second and third level administrative and regulatory jobs. Um, so I'm wondering about that and whether that is related to this wave of anti-pechismo that, that developed so that the, uh, the kind of, you know, PT can be accused of being communist in a, in a plausible, believable way. Anyway, that, so that's my question, but now I'll take other questions from the floor. Again, introduce yourselves. Yes, please. Stand up. Just real quick, Ken really here. isn't on WhatsApp, right? Ken clearly doesn't use WhatsApp, because if he did, which is what people use for political communication, what goes by co political communication in Brazil today, he would have seen all the communist uh, uh, conspiracy <laughs> theories, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Warren Hogue, and yes. I was a foreign correspondent and editor of the New York Times for more than 30 years. Five of those years I was based in Rio. It was a long time ago. Um, uh, I have a question about two institutions in Brazilian life and what has happened to them under Bolsonaro. The first is Itamarachi. Uh, I don't find it encouraging that the president is about to name his own son as the new ambassador to the United States. But I wonder, Itamarachi, in my mind, always maintained its independence and its integrity through all the ramifications and changes in Brazilian life. I wonder if that's still true. And the second institution is the military. Bolsonaro came to power speaking of his nostalgia for the military years. Um, I can't imagine the military, there's any disposition within the military for getting back into the business of governing Brazil. But my question is, is there? Another question? Back there, stand and introduce yourself, please. Say it louder, please. 
Baywatch International is my NGO. Uh, my question is, goes to you know, the entire resource plunder as against capital, the investment that we talk about, the other side, the disasters that have happened, as well as Amazon now, which is very important aspects of economy, livelihood, people's identity, culture, and uh, how would we put it together? Thank you. A third question over here. Stand up, please. That's you. Hi, uh, I'm Samantha. I'm a student here at the Graduate Center in Criminal Justice and Criminology. And I would want to add a question about uh, another institution or how criminal justice institutions or the police uh, and or linked to the military or not, or we would like to address it. But when we're talking about polarization, if you could talk about violence under the Bolsonaro uh, regime. So not just in the discourse, but actually in practice, how do you see that being impacted and or a threat to democracy? Thank you. Uh, so let's go in the reverse uh, order this time. So Paulo, you're next. I mean, on. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, I will pass for I think all these questions are, are very interesting, but I'll leave the others to. I, I have an opinion. On, I, I'm very sorry about what's happening to the Tamaraji, but I, I will let the others. Well, there. Yeah. So I'm um, going to respond to kind of everything at the same time, try to at least. Um, so I, I find the, the, the situation of the military particularly interesting. I and I. I work, I'm working on this paper for uh, Florida uh, University, and we did uh, we gathered the data to see the number of military in cabinet positions. Uh, and when you look at the evolution since the Geisel years in the mid mid 70s, basically you had something like 30 percent of military in ministerial positions. Then with the 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 democratization democratization of Brazil, uh, a, a significant decline to something like. 5%, and then with Bolsonaro is back at 27, 28%. So at the same um, level than Figueiredo and, and Geisel, but not only that, is that the militaries are heavily involved in issues well beyond security and defense. When you look at you know, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of the Environment, uh, and the other policy areas that have been outside the scope of the militaries. They are there, uh, particularly in the kind of the, not maybe not the upper echelon, uh, but sometimes in kind of a mid-level bureaucracy uh, where you have, we were discussing this, and I mentioned the, the new COAF, the Anti-Money Laundering Institute. I was reading the, the decree that created this, this new agency, and they included the military specifically uh, as kind of the, one of the categories of, of public servants who could serve there. Not that they were forbidden to do so before, but they want to single out the militaries. Kind of in a, in a sense that um, kind of after the, the return of democracy in Brazil, uh, the military were thrown to the side, and they're reclaiming their legitimate, according to them, their legitimate uh, place under the sun, uh, right? And in this sense, I think, connecting to, to communism in Brazil. I think Bolsonaro emerged and has been a persona in Brazilian politics for decades. Uh, he was the only one saying that the military dictatorship was right, that Brazil should have killed even more people, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then this evolved to a, 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 what is called cultural Marxism, the idea that there is a global conspiracy uh, involving communism and, and big banks to impose uh, you know, certain values, etc. And for us, it's sheer lunacy, but for uh, the, the Bolsonarista base, it's actually really important to mobilize them, right? And they were able to do that uh, in a, in a uh, communica political communications environment that is new in Brazil with, as my friend you was mentioning, with WhatsApp, with YouTube, Facebook, etc. Uh, so uh, I don't think the majority of Brazilians are concerned about communists, but for this minority that is really politically active, um, they are really important. Um, regarding Itamaraty, I think we're seeing the biggest shift in Brazilian foreign policy in decades, for sure. Uh, and 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 what but what we're seeing, and at least this is my personal opinion, 
the foreign minister and Bolsonaro's son, Eduardo, who's about to become, if the Senate approves, ambassador to the United States, uh, they are pushing forward this substantial change, but the bureaucracy itself is resisting or silently you know, trying not to get involved, with some exceptions. So you have an, an ambassador uh, to Geneva, to the, to the UN in Geneva, who's a clear Bolsonarista, an ambassador to Paris is a clear Bolsonarista, but the foreign policy bureaucracy itself is resisting, which speaks to what you were saying, kind of a esprit de corps that uh, remained uh, and, and I think will resist uh, until the end and it will be a major check uh, on some changes that Bolsonaro will try to implement. Thank you. Yep. Sure. I'm just gonna follow in and kind of, just kind of layer a couple of things there with, uh, with this idea of the, the, the two most respected institutions Right, the military, when in all this polling, Latino barometer, all that stuff, the military is still one of the most respected institutions in Brazil. And Bolsonaro clearly has that, that feeling, even though he, he's not quite of that circle. Right, because he wasn't, he got kicked out of the military fairly, fairly young. Um, many of the top brass of the military does, didn't think highly of him before. And they don't necessarily think highly of him now. Um, so there's been an attack or let's say a deinstitutionalization de uh, in a couple of these things. Itamaraty, clearly one of these po pockets of efficiency historically, um, and now you end up with, you know, you pick the, the chief diplomat for Brazil, our Secretary of State, who, 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 who then starts immediately attacking the fact that Itamaraty was, was isolated from those things. It was, it was, you know, it had its own way of thinking, it had its own political theory, right? And it had its, you know, its own way of, you know, talking about diversification of, of Brazilian relations um, and, and a series of other things. So the Itamarachi is clearly under attack, I think, certainly at the top. Um, the people who took over that was one branch of, of Bolsonarismo that you talked about a little bit, which is the, the Olavistas, the people who have the conspiracy theory against the cultural Marxists. And if, if you want to read about this guy, the American, America's Quarterly had a very nice interview with him, right? Brian Winter uh, interviewed, went over and interviewed him, and he's talking about all these weird pseudo-scientific, it's hard to classify, but, <laughs> but, there's a, but there's a clear section of the Bolsonaristas who really drink that stuff up. And they're the conspiracy theorist types. And they are the ones who have been empowered at, at that level of international relations and in certain other parts of the government. That side doesn't get along with the military side because the military side of, of the Brazilian bureaucracy is, you know, itself elite within the, 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 within the Brazilian state. Uh, they learn the lessons of, you know, if you read the, the, the O'Donnell and Schmitter and if you read all that other stuff about the hardliners, softliners, they understood that, you know, we need to get the heck out of government, and we don't want to do that anymore because that corrupted us as an institution. Um, but then I've also read some other stuff where people who study this more closely say that they are emboldened by the fact that then they've been sent around the world to lead the, the UN force in Haiti, and they've learned state building supposedly, and they've learned a bunch of stuff, and they feel strongly. Um, these two wings don't talk to each other until the day that somebody says something about the Amazon. Right? And then those things can agree, which is, this is our territory, damn it, and you're not going to come in here with your multinational corporations and all you name all the other conspiracy theories and tell us what we're going to have to do. So we need to occupy the territory again. And if anything, there's been a lot of really smart coverage of this, which is, you were having this problem where the, the, the kind of conspiracy theorist ones were attacking the military in the government. They, you know, they, were, they got some people fired. The military was talking down to those people, and then the Amazon is set on fire, and the French president some, says something that's just like, oh, everybody can just kind of, on this we can agree, and, and, and bringing them together. So I think those two institutions are being tested. They've resisted as well in different ways. I think the military brass that's at the top represented has been resisting and has been forcing. You know, I've heard people from the PT praising the military and government, because they're like, well, at least they're not those crazies. Right. So if you can, so if you can imagine that, um, 
The only thing I'll say really quickly about the use of violence by institutions, the military in Brazil and the police kill a lot. They kill a lot. Um, a large portion, I think one in 10 was the last study that came out. One, one in 10 homicides in Brazil in the last couple of years was, in the last year certainly, was by the police. Um, where is it rising the most in the north of Brazil? Um, but also in places like Rio. Um, I, I'm not quite sure there's a significant change there, if not just people who, who were pre, predisposed to use violence against the population in the first place, hearing all this change in language and suddenly it's okay. It's okay to kill the, the right people, right? Or, the, or the, the people who deserve it. And that's part of the reason why the, you see an uptick in this. But, the, but historically, the, the, the force apparatus in Brazil has used force against the population for a long time. Um, uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, just note, I want to note that this conversation about both conspiracy and about the politicization of Itamaraty and other institutions is a very common general story. And one of the features of all of the cases, the other cases that I have worked on is, first of all, that uh, institutions within the executive branch that had been um, uh, considered sort of nonpartisan territory uh, uh, that had some degree of uh, political neutrality attached to them and that could persist through changes of administration. Um, for example, the National Weather Service in the United States uh, uh, have become increasingly um, attacked and politicized, so that the stories that we're hearing about Brazil are not unusual stories. And this in turn, I don't know about the communist conspiracy in Brazil, uh, but this is um, very typically linked to conspiracy theories. And so you hear conspiracy theories in, in all the cases of a deep state. I don't know whether that's, uh, yes. you hear that in Brazil. Yeah. That's sort of, so instead of a neutral, politically neutral uh, executive organization, a bank or a, a monetary authority or the police or the justice uh, department or other sorts of things being uh, understood as legitimately outside of the realm of po partisan politics, you have them as pawns in the struggle against the deep state. Uh, and that's, you know, so that's a common story. It's going on in Brazil, it's going on in, uh, elsewhere as well. And I'll add to that the, the question of the second and third level uh, removals of people. Uh, the Trump administration has been removing lots of scientists from the Environmental and Department of Interior and Weather Service and things like that, saying they're no longer needed. And it really goes back to the question, the conspiracy question, do you believe in climate change? as if that's a religion rather than a scientific finding, science, climate change. Anyway, uh, let us take another set of questions if there are some. Lenny, introduce yourself loud. Okay. Uh, Lenny Silverstein. I'm um, wondering if the panel could talk about two other lines of attack in Brazilian society that haven't been mentioned. One is certainly the undermining of the work of NGOs in Brazil, which in particular was highlighted with the attacks on the, the Amazon. Um, but to my way of thinking, um, the NGOs throughout Brazil have always been um, a force for local innovation and uh, local change. And I'm wondering uh, if you care to comment on what kind of um, policy Bolsonaro has been adopting towards the NGOs. And the second part of my question is, uh, what about the social sciences uh, in Brazil? And uh, my friends have told me that through the Minister of Education, uh, much of the funding for social science in particular in um, the universities uh, has been drastically reduced. And I'm wondering if you could comment about that. Thank you. Another question? Yes, please. My Introduce yourself and say it loud. My name is Matthew Mee. I'm a former faculty member in economics at the College of uh, Staten Island here at CUNY. 
And um, I visited Brazil on numbers of occasions, uh, pretty much as a, as a tourist. But I like to uh, sort of, I guess one has to look at the comparison that one makes between Brazil and the United States. Um, it's been said that uh, Brazil is essentially now a pretty much of a mature economy. And uh, we know that in general, if we look at the GDP, that the largest aspect of uh, GDP is normally consumption by the people in that particular entity. The United States and Brazil have this big uh, disparity between consumption of uh, the majority of the population and the minority. Um, I'd like to know what has, uh, has there been the same kind of campaign to sort of suppress uh, the majority of people who in a sense have lower income, and therefore in a sense inflicting harm on the Brazilian economy itself uh, by so doing. Uh, and uh, I'd like to know in a sense, uh, has that led to essentially a lesser participation of the people who in a sense would have that, uh, that, uh, that need, and also to give that to the GDP of the economy. And therefore, in a sense, the Brazilian economy loses a great deal as the American economy does in terms of actual real output and, and benefit for not only the economy, but for itself. So it's uh, like when we look at the difference between, let's say, a, um, a loss of uh, employment and, and real income level, and for example, gross uh, domestic product uh, for the economy as a whole. Um, I guess I'll stop there at that point. Thank you. Uh, another question? Martin, introduce yeah. yourself loud, please stand up. Uh, I'm Martin, I'm from CUNY in Columbia. I'm late because of the Israel election uh, panel. Um, so I was wondering, do you have any comments on Bolsonaro's relationship with Israel? And a sillier question, why suddenly are Brazilians doing away with visas for Americans? Is there any rationale? Mm -hmm. Any last questions to add, since I think this will be the last round? OK. Uh, who wants to go first this time? So I begin. Uh, I can start go. with this question here. It's red. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a fascinating question. And, and, and I, of course, I mean, um, Which question? the question about wage growth. And, and wage goods, and whether uh, whether you could tilt economic development in such a way that you shift consumption to basic goods, and, and in that way stimulate growth. Yet there are many. Uh, I mean, the main, you can't forget that uh, Brazil's GDP is one tenth per capita of the United States, or less than one tenth. So that's that's a, a glaring disparity. But in other aspects, the two economies have certain things in common. Uh, they both are very closed economies and, and, and with a huge dominance of consumption and very dynamic consumption systems. Um, but, but the PT, uh, one of the early uh, policies of the PT uh, was indeed uh, to, to stimulate growth uh, through the wage, through very rapid increases in minimum, in the real minimum wage, and uh, to attempt to stimulate, uh, this is an old theory, uh, the wage goods uh, kind of industry, so the basic, basic industries. Uh, and there were a lot of subsidies directed that way. The policy of increasing the real minimum wage was extraordinarily successful. Um, and that's because uh, for many, many, many years, wage growth had been suppressed in Brazil. Um, it, I think that when, when the PT came to power, there was a generalized consensus, uh, at least that the people who thought about it, that it was really time to address something of the income distribution. Um, and at the same time, there were increasing evidences that at least in Brazil, uh, working through the minimum wage uh, would have an impact. So the, the real minimum wage, I forget now by how much it grew, but it, 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 it more or less quadrupled uh, in, in during the Lula years. And, and it did bring in um, 
uh, so-called new lower middle class, and it did stimulate growth a lot, but it did not stimulate the wage goods industry, not at all. I mean, in fact, uh, this was the time when, when uh, like in the United States, uh, and second to the United States, it's the, the biggest other second example, the Chinese penetration into Brazilian industry was massive. Um, and there was, in fact, a wholesale uh, destruction of sectors of the Brazilian industry uh, by cheaper imports from, from China, and that was one of the things that helped consumption grow. So you did have a boom in consumption and a, a very much of a, an increase in, in wealth, in well-being, and in, in capacity to consume, but a lot of that was because finally you had more efficient producers supplying the market, reducing some of the monopoly power and the oligopoly power of the old Brazilian producers uh, that, that, that could not really supply those kind of goods. Uh, and that's one of the big arguments like here about the deindustrialization de of Brazil, which is much more significant than what has happened to manufacturing. Uh, in the U.S., the drop of manufacturing uh, as a share of output in Brazil. So that's that's a very um, a, a very long debate, uh, um, and uh, you know part of this uh, uh, old protectionism in Brazil uh, and and the ability to still open the economy further is one of the things that's going debating today. Uh, again, uh, a quick comment on on the. Uh, um, on the social scientists and the Ministry of Education. Yes, I mean, I think uh, Roberto mentioned that the ministers of education that have been appointed are absolutely disastrous. Uh, the first person that was selected was someone respected, but because he had made some comments against Bolsonaro, they dumped the guy. Um, and, and, um, uh, and, and the Ministry of Education is in shambles. Uh, uh, but, the problem of funding the universities is a deeper problem, and it's part of the big fiscal issue. And, and uh, the cuts, uh, because of these um, limits that are ongoing and, and, and the decision of where money should go, uh, it being, I mean, a lot of the budget for the Ministry of Education is uh, hardwired to go to specific programs. Uh, which exclude the federal universities. Okay, so these are programs that for good reasons at a particular time go to basic education, some of them go to vocational education, but they exclude the universities. And so the universities were always funded from supplementary funds. Um, and yes, this government uh, is against uh, some of the universities, not all of them, but the fact is that there are no supplements. So even if they were in favor of the universities, it would be still a crisis of funding the universities. And this has been going on for quite a while. But it is disastrous, I agree with you, and the way it's uh, taking place is disastrous. Finally, a quick comment on the NGOs. It is uh, terrible what they've been doing with the NGOs. But I think the real tragedy of what happened to the Amazon uh, response to this thing is the story that uh, Bob Kaufman has been mentioning and others have mentioned that they've destroyed, I mean somehow or other Brazil had built a workable environmental bureaucracy, let's put it this way, and a set of policies that were very lengthy and criticized and this and that, but they dealt with the problem and had it more or less under control. It wasn't a big example, but it worked. And one of the first things that the Bolsonaro administration did is to try to dismantle this. And so it is the response to the, to the, to the crisis that has been so appalling and, 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 and the dismantling of institutions that have taken years to grow uh, very quickly. That said, not all NGOs in Brazil are good. By no means, and and there were there was a tremendous abuse abuse of NGOs being used to fund uh, political parties, um, and 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 that created a kind of a, 
an environment in Brazil uh, where a lot of people felt quite comfortable with critiques of the NGOs. Thank you. Next. Whichever one of you wants to volunteer. Go ahead. I'll go back to the foreign policy question, the Netanyahu, United States question. Well, I, I argue that we're seeing the biggest shift in Brazilian foreign policy in decades. Um, my interpretation is that the Bolsonaro administration uh, began with, with the promise of really changing or reversing uh, the, everything that the Workers' Party did. And in this sense, I think foreign policy was kind of the the promised land in many ways. Uh, and you mentioned um, Brazil's relation with Israel. It was not only a matter of, of uh, changing Brazil's uh, position. Brazil has been, uh, you know, Brazil was presiding the General Assembly when, um, when the, 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 the State of Israel was created. Uh, Brazil shifted a little bit. Uh, and during the military dictatorship, at one point, were really supportive of the uh, anti-Israel camp here at the UN. Then went back to kind of a more, more pro-Israel position in the 1990s. But now with Bolsonaro, the story was: let's not only support Israel, but let's change the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, and then it was not only about you know having close relationships, a close relationship with the United States. But let's support Trump, right? Which is very different, of course. So it was about the son of the president being here in Washington with the hat on Trump 2020. It was about Bolsonaro inside the White House saying that he was confident that Trump is going to win the election uh, next next year. Things that had were simply unimaginable not long ago for a Brazilian head of state to say that here in the United States. My question is, you know, as someone who, who studies international relations, is, you know, to what extent there are structural constraints to Bolsonaro and the Bolsonarista camp, right? In the in the case of Israel, there were clear uh, structural constraints uh, that, you know, maybe the evangelical base, which is super important for him, really wanted Bolsonaro to move the embassy from from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But at the end of the day, this would this could jeopardize Brazil's relations with with Islamic states, a huge, huge market um, for Brazil's uh, agriculture and protein exports, uh, which, by the way, are also on Bolsonaro's base. That at the end of the day, the military were able to convince Bolsonaro, just let's go to Israel, let's open uh, something like a consular office in Jerusalem. It's going to be like for business. You're going to be with Netanyahu, and that's it. And that's where we stopped, right? Of course, Brazil is very supportive of Israel at the UN, but uh, we didn't went kind of all the way to the end. With the United States, I, I, I can't really see the limits now, but it's interesting to see how in several moments in Brazilian um, foreign policy history, he had presidents stepping in and saying we have to align Brazil with the United States. We had that immediately after 1964. Uh, we had that in 1989 when Kohler was elected. And it's interesting to see that usually these moments last for something like one or two years. And then reality, you know, kicks back and, and basically you see that these are, you know, the two biggest countries in the hemisphere that they can, you know, try to be good friends, but at the end of the day there are national interests, including, you know, Brazil's uh, uh, desire uh, not to have the United States too involved with South America, particularly uh, near Brazilian borders, that, you know, push uh, uh, or change kind of the dynamic uh, of the relationship towards a more uh, competitive uh, dynamic. Will we see this with Bolsonaro? I think if the military were more influential, we were we probably already, you know, we would have seen something in this direction. We haven't. Uh, um, actually, you know, all signs, including now some talks of a free trade deal, which I think is likely to take place uh, in the near future, in the next few years. Uh, but it seems that um, that you know Bolsonaro wants to go all the way with Trump, unless, of course, the Democrats win next year. Mm -hmm. And if we have uh, President Biden, President Warren, President um, 
Sanders. Sanders or Paris. was it Paris? I think we'll see a very, very delicate moment for the bilateral uh, relationship because of issues like the Amazon that was mentioned here, human rights, etc. So we'll probably see a, a really, really difficult time for, for Washington-Brazilian relations. I'll jump in real quick, just, just add a little bit. I think this thing with the visa is really, really interesting, right? Because it's, it was one of those last remnants of the Itamarachi's independent way of thinking, which is we can stick it to the Americans because we can. We are third world, tercero mundismo, but we are the big ones, so we can afford to do this. If you think about it, it's, it's, it's a particular policy that accomplishes nothing other than, well, you know, if you apply for a visa to Brazil, and I don't know if, how many of you have done this, you'll never be denied, but you're going to have to pay, and you're going to have to waste a day in our consulate like our people have to do. Right? It accomplishes nothing um, other than to annoy. Um, but that's a position of a, this kind of thinking of like, we're a large enough power, we're a local hegemon, but we can never play on the same level, but we can be annoying in a way that others can't. And this change of a policy done by the president from the top really quickly is a symbol of like, you know what, we're cutting all this crap. Like, no, it makes absolutely no sense for Brazil. We need the money from US tourists, whatever, so, so we're not going to do it. And by the way, we're doing it unilaterally. We're not asking for anything in return. Did Congress approve it? It doesn't have to be. Exactly. It's a policy, yeah, you can do it, you know, chicaneta, right? So, so they did that really quickly. Um, and, and the fact that it was done unilaterally, it's, it's, it's a sign. It's a brushback of like, you know, no, 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 this stuff is done. We're going to do, and we're going to align closer to the United States in terms of our policy. We're going to signal with a thing in Israel, and then we're going to change our minds really quick, because I didn't think this through, and, 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 all, and all that stuff. But You know who were the best friends in terms of, I'm not going as far back as Teddy Roosevelt or anything like that, but Fernando Cardoso and Bill Clinton were really, really good friends. Like if you read their, their biographies, if you read all the stuff, like in the Clinton library, presidential library, there's a big picture of Fernando Cardoso um, as the global partners. Guess what? Brazil still put a wrench in the free trade of the Americas, right? Still put a wrench in the Doha round and all that stuff. I think it goes to what Roberto was saying is that at some point national interest comes in. And it doesn't matter if the presidents are buddies or not. Eventually, this stuff, you know, breaks down. I mean, I think the Bolsonaros and the Trumps are getting along right now. They haven't had a chance to brush each other the wrong way yet. And that's not even talking about potentially domestic political changes. So, so I don't know how, how long that is. But there's a clear thing there. And then about NGOs and about the social sciences, in this kind of rising polarization, it's very clear. Every NGO is is basically just covering either imperialists or communists or cultural Marxists. I'm sorry to simplify, but that's what it is. They were accused of setting the Amazon on fire by the president. Um, there's no money for science, and if there's no money for physics and chemistry, you can bet there's no money for people who do what I do. Uh, right? Absolutely not. There's, there's that anti-scientific platform. There's also a disregard of, like, you know, if private universities can fund their own research, great. But if not, you know, there's not enough money in the budget and there's priorities. And if science, if hard sciences STEM aren't a priority, social sciences are not going to be. Um, plus, we're all communists anyway, right? <laughs> what, you know, um, supposedly. Sorry. Thank you, Georgie. Bob, last comments? I'll try to be very uh, brief. Um, question about the relationship to Israel uh, sort of triggered. So, no. Yes. Yes. Uh, triggered a larger, a, a broader thought, which was um, uh, the, the vast right-wing conspiracy, uh, international uh, right-wing conspiracy. And OK, I'll put quotation marks about it, around it. But um, it does seem to me that you see a remarkable, whether it's kind of the result of conspiracy or not, a coordination of rhetoric and worldviews um, around um, uh, extreme nationalism, exclusionary uh, politics, uh, 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 fight against the kind of international architecture that was, had been built up since World War II. <clears throat> um, now, 
Uh, that I think is absolutely correct that these have these, this creates these bizarre relationships, you know, where the state of Israel is in league with anti Semites and Hungary and, and the United States. Uh, um, I mean, you know, just sort of blows your mind, you know, you can't figure out what's going on. But I do think that there are two things that are, it's not, that this is not something that will simply break up around national interests. Uh, that'll slow it down. But I think there are two things that are very important in this. One is the creation of a kind of a rhetoric, um, uh, 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 a narrative uh, of, um, again, of nationalism, of, of, um, of extreme kind of um, ethnicity uh, that is extremely powerful. And, uh, and that's likely to endure. And the other is mutual political support. There's no accident that, um, you know, Bolsonaro and his sons put on Make America Great Again hats. And it's no accident that Trump supports people like Bolsonaro, uh, Netanyahu, Orban, uh, you know, Putin, uh, you know, you name it. Um, uh, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, and obviously these things are going to fluctuate over time and the circumstances change, but I, I think that we have yet to kind of untangle and understand this kind of international cooperation as a whole. Thank you, Bob. Let me thank the panel for a wonderfully informative and very sobering uh, set of comments and reflections and information. I think it's, it's for me at least, very useful to, to hear what you've all had to say. I thank uh, Mauricio and the Bosner Center for sponsoring it. I thank the panelists for coming and you, the audience, for coming and questioning. So thank you all very much.